Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Haunted Vermont Podcast. My name is Paul Dosky, and joining us is, well, um, I'm going to go as far as saying a legendary illustrator or graphic designer because, I mean, his artwork is phenomenal. And if you do not know his work, then what the hell are you doing? Go to the internet and type in this gentleman's name because this gentleman we are speaking to you is none other than Sam Sharon. And I don't even know how to even introduce him a- a anymore. So I'm just going to shut up and let him talk. So welcome aboard, Sam. Good evening. Um, thanks so much for the invite. Yeah. Greetings and welcome everybody. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Um, you know, I, been wanting to reach out to you ever since I heard uh, David Weathery was making a book about my beloved Green Mountain State. And obviously, as you know, you know, I do the Haunted Vermont thing. Um, I've actually been collecting stories between what I know and from other people and authors, um, you know, since 2012. So, um, but it's, it's just been a fun little hobby, and then uh, eventually I figured why not branch out more and try to talk with more people about different things. And in this case, I think it's kind of works out because not only is David like an investigator and all this stuff, and he writes books about the different cryptids of each state, sort of. Well, that's what he, I think he's trying to get to. But anyway, you know, the fact that he did one on Vermont is uh very interesting and it's just one of those things where it's like you know the artwork alone if that just doesn't grab you uh even on a bookshelf then i guess sam did not do a job but in this case i, I love <laughs> sam jo- uh, sam's work and i did not know about sam until i found david weathery with his uh other monster books and that's where I became a fan of your work, Sam. So, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, no, that's that's really nice to hear. Um, me and David go back a long way, um, uh, more than ten years now, I believe. Um, and I think I've I've worked with him. Um, it's more of a collaboration at this stage, where with his Monster State series, we're trying to go for all of the states uh, and then some. Um, and eventually probably going to branch into Canada and beyond. But um, I think so far we're up to book 14 just for the Monster States. But I've obviously illustrated other books in his uh, library, if you want to call it that. At some point he's going to have the Weatherly Library Um, (laughs) because he does a whole series of books on ghosts. I'm sure you're familiar with hauntings and things um, from everywhere. Uh, And I think that's a a collaboration with a couple of other people as well. But David's great. I've known him forever. Um, wonderful chap and a wealth of knowledge. And as you say, he's done the uh, the Vermont State now with uh, the infamous champ on the cover. So, um, yeah, no. <laughs> yes, and we will be getting into that way out of the cover between the front and the back, too, because it's not just champ that shows up, but... Real quick, Sam, so to car- let's kind of start this off, and you mm. already have, like, answered a question, but maybe we can, like, um, uh, go into it a little bit more. But anyway, sure. uh, let's start off with people that may not know your work. So who the hell are you, and how did you get into this, you know, the strange world of the what I'm going to call the horror universe. Now, real quick, mm. uh, Sam, when <laughs> I was trying to figure out this question of like, usually, <laughs> you know, I already, I usually just throw in the word horror, but with you, I almost first put cryptid universe, but then I was just like, no, I know Sam's artwork a little bit more than just cryptid. So I'm just going to put horror universe. So how did you get into it? Um, well, as you could probably tell from uh, my accent, my voice, I'm originally from the UK. Uh, I live in Los Angeles now, but I grew up in the northwest of England. And for the most part, childhood consisted of books on natural history and dinosaurs and, and that sort of thing. But as I got a little older, um, I started to 
discover things that shouldn't be or things that never were and all these legends and myths from across all of Europe, uh, but mainly in England, there was talk of fairies and ghosts, uh, lake monsters and things like that. Big werewolf um, mythology stemming from England. Of course, you have our, our witches and witch trials and things like that. But um, yeah, I just, the older I got, the more books I collected. I buried my head in it when everyone else was sort of running outside and playing. I'd be inside with a, a book and a pencil. Um, and then getting into the, the age of the internet, it really just, the floodgates opened where now we can sort of contact other people like yourself who go on investigations and are really, you know, and enthusiastic about this whole wide spectrum of the unexplained and, um, horror in general, uh, movies and film books, novels, graphic novels, comic books, um, the whole gamut of it. I, I just absolutely love it and try to weave my work into those sort of corners of entertainment as much as I can because I just live and breathe anything to do with um, creepy stuff. So <laughs> it sounds very vague, but um, that's, that's pretty much the same story as anybody really that's sort of into this stuff is it just became an obsession. And so it became a career. So I'm quite fortunate in that sense. <laughs> well, uh, I think it's been a while since I've shared this. I don't actually, now that I think about it, I don't know if I've ever shared it on this podcast. I know I shared it on my other one, but anyway, so Sam, uh, mm -hmm. I got into the realm of horror, I guess, by my father. And just because he was more into the horror than my mother was, but my first ever horror film that I kind of snuck down there to creep around a corner to make sure n my parents couldn't see me was Bram Stoker Dracula. And oh, wow. it was during the werewolf scene where uh, Mina was on the table. I and know one. <laughs> see me now. <laughs> Do not see me. Yeah. Yeah, that one. <laughs> and I kind of watched a little bit of that part and I was just like, I think I should not be watching this and then i somehow managed to sneak back upstairs and how old were you at caught. the time if you don't mind me asking i uh, was probably seven or eight wow <laughs> um, um I, my yeah. my mom tried to sneak me into the cinema to see that um i think i was 13 at the time and they unfortunately they wouldn't let us in because they just they knew I wasn't 18 years old in England. You have to be 18. So, um, she tried, but couldn't get me into the cinema. They were too strict on it, which is a shame, but, um, yeah, that's, needless to say, <laughs> I've seen it many times since. That's interesting considering, you know, you're usually okay as long as you have a parental guardian. Yeah. Yeah. Not in England. The rules are the rules. Um, which is a shame. <laughs> Well, I wish you got to see it. I guess later on. So, uh, so, so what what's what's your favorite? What's your favorite horror film today? Oh God, favorite or horror film today? Your, or your top three? If if you have to go more than one, <laughs> I, I'm gonna have to go more than one for a couple reasons. So let's we'll start off with the black and white silent film Nosferatu. Okay, uh, just because with the amount of stuff that happened or was involved with that film to begin with because of Bram Stoker we are thankful to even be able to watch it today and you know I still find it to be one of the greatest silent movies of the time just because of how well shot and creepy Nosferatu is and what it's supposed to represent as a as a whole I guess mm -hmm. just because, you know, back in the day, we take a look at like tuberculosis and those people that had that at the beginning, um, you know, we would kind of go into the whole those of vampires, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, that's a great choice as well. I mean, that film, incidentally, uh, was released in 1922. But on my birthday. So I share the birthday with the release of Nosferatu. That's awesome. 
Yeah, it's and, pretty good. <laughs> and uh, last year, no oh God, yeah, last year I'm pretty sure it was either last year or 2021. It celebrated its 100th anniversary. So. Oh yeah, that was last year. Yeah, 100 years. Yeah, yeah. crazy. 2022. <laughs> That's yeah, amazing. And as you say, we're lucky to have it because there was a court order, wasn't there, from the widow of Bram Stoker because he had died, but she took the film director, F.W. Morneau, to court and won to say that it's too similar to her late husband Bram Stoker's book and that they ordered all of the film copies to be destroyed. And, and somehow, I think maybe there was some in a box under a floorboard somewhere. Somebody saved a copy, thank God. Um, we have that now uh incredible really and it is unfortunately a copy it's a it's a ripoff it's plagiarism it's a shame that that happens every day even to me um but for what it is as you say as, a, as an art piece the way it was shot in the very very early 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 days of cinema um stylistically things were shot in uh negative and reversed to make it look like night and, and make it look yes. like day. And it just so clever. Everything. He actually, the actor, Max Shrek put actual fish lenses in his eyes from a dead fish to, to look, you know, otherworldly. And it worked, didn't it? I mean, incredible, incredible way ahead of its time. So, yeah. so, so yes, there, thank goodness we have that. <laughs> and what's even more crazy is when, uh, oh God. I'm, I'm probably exaggerating this when I say this, but it was somewhere around eight, ten years ago. They ended up finding more footage, and they ended up having to re-release the film again because of the extra footage <laughs> that they found. So, wow. I mean, whatever. <laughs> That's, yeah, I mean, why not? Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to the remake uh, in uh, in a sense that... Oh, you're nice talking Robert Egger. Yeah, the Eggers remake. Um, the guy who did The Witch and The Lighthouse. Um, he's somehow been given the rights to do this. Um, I'm not entirely sure about the cast decisions, um, but uh, I believe they're using Willem Dafoe again because he already played it in another movie that was, uh, if you've heard of, um, what was it called? Something... A uh, tale of a va- shadow of the vampire, I think it was. Shadow of the vampire. Yeah, and it had Eddie Izzard was in there, um, and John Malkovich played the director Max Shrek, and Willem Dafoe played Nosferatu, the the Count Orlok. Yes. Um But they that film they they tried to sort of portray it as though he really was a vampire, the actor, um, which was a nice take. But with this remake, with Edgar's Edgar's remake. Uh, they, they're using Willem Dafoe again as the same Nosferatu character. So that's going to be interesting because it would almost link those together, which is quite nice in a way, consistently. Though I never thought he was quite physically accurate enough. I'm a, I'm a stickler being a visual person myself. I like things to be accurate as much as possible. Okay, so that is why I will have to throw in the witch because that comes so close to what those type of people were dealing with back in the day and i just find that like so i remember watching it in the movie theaters with a friend of mine they didn't like it i Mm -hmm. went home and i was just like oh my god this is probably (laughs) a masterpiece you know like and i remember seeing all the yeah the negative comments for it. And I remember going on social media and I was just like, for all you guys giving this film a hard time, (laughs) you need to, this is what you need to do. You need to stop thinking about going into a film to get you up to get scared. Maybe you should just open up your mind and realize that this film is supposed to represent like almost like an American history lesson in a way. Oh yeah. Yeah, and and it was fantastic, wasn't it? The way they, the way they put it together, as you said, Everything. very, very accurate, uh, which made it disturbing because it was a horrible time. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, because the way I, I like, you know, even me and my uh, 
girlfriend even talk about it because she never thought at the time thought like what i'm like you gotta sit down and we're watching this because you need to <laughs> see this and so me and her agreed about a few things where we speculate with the fact of that you know even though the witch is supposed to be everything or everywhere we kind of mm-hmm. made it look like they they almost made it look like not only is it everywhere but it's it's contaminating the family's mind so much that now it's becoming like that disease where you cannot even trust each other and which mm-hmm. is perfect because back in the day with the witch trials and this and that like it became exactly that, right? Like oh, yeah. nobody could be trusted. Yeah. 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 Horrible, horrible time. Um, l- you know, very little education, lots of superstition and mix all those together with fear and, and just paranoia. My goodness. What an awful way to, you, what, you know, if you're accused, that's it. Your life's over. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Unless you're somehow, were able to i'm just gonna say escape but that was on yeah run away <laughs> yeah yeah because um, even, even if even if they bless you and like cleanse you and everything they still put you to death they set you yeah. free kind of thing just awful <laughs> awful and yeah, the first, i don't think i don't think me and you would be sat here if we were oh no oh god no <laughs> we'd no, be long no. gone oh yeah oh <laughs> what's that you devil <laughs> it's like yeah i'm done i'm done uh Knowing my walk, I would be like, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Giles, that would say more weight. I think I would probably be that same guy. Um, right, there you go. <laughs> so, so, oh man. So, my last film, I guess I would have to pick, would be the 2009 version of Trick or Treat from uh, oh. Michael uh, Daughtry. I don't think I saw it. I have a fly in front of me. Sorry. Oh, I have a fly too, so don't worry. If, and, you know, it's, I'm going to go by f- for for the record here. I would even throw in hit Michael's uh, Krampus too for around the holiday season for a Krampus time. That was a, that was a good film. Um, there was, a, I mean, it was not quite Krampus <laughs> in terms of the real sort of the legends and stuff. It was very commercially Krampus. Um, yeah, it was definitely twisted, and it was a great fun film. It felt like National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation with a bit of gremlins thrown in. Um, it was enjoyable. I, I thought it was a great film, um, but I've I've yet to see a really good proper Krampus movie. Maybe I'll make one. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. What the space? What the space? There you go. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I've seen so many different Krampus movies that it's like I I have to go with his. Like, I don't. I think it's just because I just like the story that they were trying to do, like that old mm-hmm. ancient uh, legend where back in the day this is what happened, and then as the grandmother got older, it followed her to the new family and this and that. So yeah, I mean. I wouldn't want that. <laughs> no, <laughs> I would not want that either. Yeah. Uh, no one likes the family curse. No, that's a great choice. Yeah, um, yeah. So then I would, like I said, I would probably just end it with probably trick or treat for for that. Like trick or treat, for Krampus. I would say. Um, mm. Now, if we, if, if like, so I have some guilty pleasure. So like, um, so like for Thanksgiving, I will watch Thanks Killing. Okay. <laughs> Like stupidest <laughs> film you can ever imagine. I, but, I've heard of it. I uh, uh, believe there's a remake of that coming. Is it Eli Roth's doing it? I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe I heard that wrong, but hmm. it's it rings a bell. Um, I've yet to see the old one though, the original, shall we say? The one with the uh, the puppet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay. So. Um, what would be your top three favorite films, would you say, Sam? You know, that's that's just an impossible question to, uh, to answer. 
Um, I mean, you know, like yourself, there's just too many to choose from. Um, you, you can't go wrong with John Carpenter's The Thing, mm. um, his, his take on The Thing concept. Um, that was an incredible movie, special effects-wise, story-wise, acting, the music, everything was perfect. Um, and apparently when it came out, it flopped. It, it wasn't a hit at all at the time when it was released. And now it's, you know, it's a cult classic. They've released books on it. And there's tribute gallery artworks for it and stuff like that. The board um, game. Yeah. I mean, video games, everything. Um, so the thing is definitely up there. I'll always go back and watch that and enjoy it every time. I, ne- I can never get bored with that. Um, what, what did you think of the... The prequel? <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I liked it. I wish they would have used puppetry and, as, you know, as we were talking about puppets, uh, practical effects, um, as, as John Carpenter's crew did. Um, it seemed to take away a lot of uh, the sort of the realism to it. You know, let's just be real about it. It just doesn't look real when it's computer generated. It really stands out. It was good. It was um, very well done. But when when you have too much detail happening, it, ironically, it doesn't look real. Um, I thought the the story and the concept were great, though. I liked the idea that it was something that was not to ruin it for anyone who hasn't seen it, but it was it was something that was obviously an alien that was collecting DNA from all over the galaxy, and that's why it could transform into anything. And I thought it was brilliant how they brought all that out, and and the entire film takes place before the thing. So, <laughs> um, really good film, really good uh, remake, prequel, pre-make. <laughs> um, Bram Stoker's Dracula is, is a, a, a fond favorite. Um, I wouldn't put it up there as the top. Um, I did like the ritual. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, actually, the one from Netflix, right? Yeah, it's about the the British hikers yes. in Sweden, um, and then the sort of the uh, the black goat, uh, H.P. Lovecraft demon type creature is in the woods. Um, and I'm thinking now, what, uh, the ruins. Have you seen the ruins about the plants? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that was fantastic. Um, that was a really good concept. There's, once in a while, you'll get a, a really unique idea, um, and that was one of them. Another one would be Tremors. That that was a really unique idea, you know? Um, something that you, you... There's been other films that are similar, but, you know, something that could exist, and you could sort of say that Tremors, in a sense, is a cryptid movie, and The Ruins is a, is a cryptid movie. Um, yeah, I mean, you've you've heard of the Mongolian deathworm. It's it's sort of a lot of people say that Tremors is sort of a really um, gross exaggeration of that scenario. But uh, I, I love the Tremors films, all of them. You know, they're, they're, some of them are really silly, and that's what makes them great. Um, speaking of silly, the Evil Dead series, oh, you know, the whole yep. the whole franchise, um, absolutely brilliant. Every, every one of them. There's not a bad film in that entire <laughs> catalog. Um, Sam Raimi is a genius. Uh, the the new directors who did the recent films, equally good. Um, really enjoyed the recent one. Evil, uh, Dead, Evil Rise. Dead Rise. Yeah, I, I saw that on the big screen and really enjoyed it. I thought it was great. They got all the, the sort of gimmicks in there. It was brilliant. Um, yeah, yeah. I, there's no great. end of, of films. You know, there's no end of horror films that. You can always go back to Pumpkinhead with Lance Henriksen is another one, you know, uh, the Hellraiser franchise, um, up to number 10, <laughs> uh, with Doug Bradley, you know, all the way up to number 10 and then we can just forget the rest. Um, <laughs> I thought the the new one, the, the recent take, it's not even a remake. It's a completely new story. Um, uh, you're talking, was, you're talking to one with the female, not to cut you off. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, I thought that was really well done. It was a nice, unique story. And I don't know how familiar you are with um, the Hellraiser franchise after the third one. It sort of um, 
becomes individual stories. It's different people who find the box. So every movie's different. Uh, but it always had Doug Bradley in it. And I thought, you know, that's that was, you know, the hook. <laughs> that works. <laughs> excuse, excuse the pun. Yeah. Um, but um, I thought the remake was or the, the new take rather, because again, it's not the same story at all. It's a completely new set of characters, different setting, different time, different Cenobites. Um, uh, and it was nice to see the sort of the expansion of, of Clive's world um, really kind of pushed to its limits in different areas uh, that had never been done before. So I thought it was nice. I, I hope they do more, you know, um, they don't have to keep the same people. They can just change it again, make it different again, you know, make, make one where it's just pets. That'd be good. <laughs> Perfect. <You know? laughs> yeah, no, like, like, you know, I'll, I'll even dr- go as far as saying, I'll, um, I'll drop the, the alien franchise in. Um, I'll just say, let's go to yeah. three at least. Uh, Red Direction is Red Direction. It's a film. <laughs> film. <laughs> film. <laughs> uh, Prometheus uh-huh. is um, beautifully shot. Way too much goddamn talking. It was a little slow, yeah. Um, you know, when you've had the the glory of Aliens, where it's a full on action movie, um, anything after that kind of became dull. It's it's it was so good that second film because the first film is a horror film and the second yes. film is an action movie. So where do you go after horror action? I, you know, they didn't. They, I think they sort of hinted at going towards romance, but it didn't quite work. Um, and it's, you know, it's, uh, you can't do comedy. It's alien. <laughs> I mean, you had that with Alien versus Predator. There were certain aspects of comedy in there because it seems the later Predator movies have become a joke. Um, <laughs> yeah. Prey was good. Um, Prey was phenomenal. It was very, very good. The cast were incredible. Um, all of them just absolutely sold the movie. It was really well done. Um, the Predator, with Shane Black directing, who was starring in the first film. And directed awful. the first film. Yeah, yeah awful. Yeah. Awful. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely awful. I think I watched that twice, and I only watched it again because I thought we were going to do a podcast on it, and we never did. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, you have the excuse there. But um, yeah, I don't think I'll ever get those two hours back. It was pretty bad. <laughs> I've been asked if um, if I would recommend a Predator, and I basically we said that you can rent it for free, <laughs> or if it's on Tubi or something, then watch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Style wise, you know, if you like looking at monsters. It's something you could maybe have on in the background, but the story and everything, and that's that ridiculous Iron Man type suit at the end. Nonsense. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even going to go into it. Yeah, yeah, it's terrible. Anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, Sam, to get back on to uh, why we're actually talking to you, but I mean, you know, maybe some people enjoyed that. Or people are probably like, "All right, let's get on to what we really came to with the two. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so anyway, uh, Sam, uh, you know, you were mentioning that you were younger. You know, you were one of those kids that wanted to get the books, write stuff down, do this and that. You didn't want to go outside and play. Basically, you wanted to learn about stuff that are not even supposed to be existing that people are claiming to be seeing and this and that so as Mm -hmm. you got older what um tributed to you to want to you know draw do graphic design and illustration to like what you do today um so i guess what kind of sparked the fire that made you kind of want to bring the creature that you have read wrote down about you know basically Mm -hmm. the life I think I think really it all stems from um, my enjoyment of of other people's artwork, um, and also my sort of observation of of other people's bad artwork. 
in a sense that I, I'll be reading a book. Uh, for example, as a kid, I, I would maybe looking at a book on Loch Ness and the illustrations were, um, and we're not even talking about witness illustrations. We're talking about maybe the cover of the book, you know, were just bad. And I thought something of, of such a caliber as this legend deserves better artwork. And it also sort of stemmed from my, uh, my upbringing of spending a lot of time when I did go out was in museums and natural history museums. So I'd be, I'd be sat underneath a dinosaur skeleton and, you know, I'd be learning about it. I, you know, books full of it. So I knew my anatomy and I knew my natural history. And so I also sort of wanted to share my knowledge and my, my, my ability uh, to draw. Um, according to my mom, I've been drawing monsters since I could hold a pencil. So I was, I was pretty good as a kid. And so growing up, I wanted to sort of share that enjoyment of what something should look like in the best way possible. And it really did sort of stem from other people's works. Um, you know, I'd, I'd be looking at uh, Saturday morning movies, uh, Jason and the Argonauts, um, Clash of the Titans, those kind of old monster movies with Ray Harryhausen, the stop motion, uh, almost claymation monsters. Again, I would look at those, and after a while, as I got older, they didn't look as good anymore. They're, they're nostalgic to me now, and I, I have them all on DVD, and I'll go back and I'll watch, you know, Valley of the Guanji or uh, Lost World, you know, all of those classics. Um, and uh, Gorgo is another one. Um, you know, even all the old Godzilla movies, you know, after a while, when you see it's a guy in a suit, it it kind of... You want more. You want something more realistic. And I think we're living in an age now where when they're remaking films like Godzilla, they're trying to make it look as realistic as possible. And I like that, um, particularly from uh, an enjoyment standpoint of if it's a goofy-looking thing, it's, it's laughable and it can't be taken seriously. With the movie, going back to Alien, uh, it was even though this thing doesn't exist, it was so well executed and designed that once they took the illustrations from H.R. Geiger and turned them into this three-dimensional creature that you know a man was in a you know was a still a guy in a suit, but it was something no one had ever seen before. That really is is the sort of thing that I look for in films and in books and illustrations and comic books and graphic novels that really inspires me, and and, that, and that's really kind of where it all began is I was, I would just sort of uh, naturally go in that direction. You know, I want to do that. So I'm going to do that. Um, lots of influences of other artists, you know, that really as a teenager and in my twenties, I would look at and think, God, I, I'd love to be able to do that and be able to illustrate my own ideas and show people what's in my head, but at this level and maybe beyond. Um, so that's really where it all it all came from is wanting to share the enjoyment of weird stuff. That fair enough. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, in a nutshell, <laughs> yeah, in a nutshell, <laughs> God do a, Oh man. Like, I, uh, I don't. Even, I can't even think of it off the top of my head which one it would be. Unfortunately, um, it would be the one where uh, the three-headed dragon was in it, and then the twist too was the 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 bad guy, the whoever, the soldiers that were involved in it. They were right, like beetles or something, like. They 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 were just they weren't really human or something like they were beetles. Oh, made... I vaguely remember this. And there was a an elevator scene at the very end, and they blow up the building, and these people that were aliens turned into cockroaches, kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a classic. <laughs> I be, I believe that they there's one scene where the the heroes. I think there's three or four. Uh, they were, you know, Asian Japanese people who had illustrated themselves with marker pens, like with guns or something, on a big piece of paper or cardboard, and they were really well illustrated. And they put it in an elevator to fool the people, <laughs> and they put explosives behind it. 
<laughs> and so they sent the they sent the elevator up the skyscraper, and when it opened, these these bad guys, these cockroach alien people, but just looked like people until they died, were fooled by this illustration, <laughs> and they opened fire on this this opening of the elevator yeah that was ridiculous those were great movies though because for the most part it was nothing to do with the monsters you know nope <laughs> which is strange people complain about the new godzilla where it's too many people but they forget that the original godzilla movies was also quite a lot about people you know yeah the main all, focus all was never godzilla yeah yeah he was always just happening in the background yeah yeah, basically. He was just always there in the background just for the purpose of just filling in for the background. I guess. Coming and going. Yeah, different eras of Godzilla. He'd either be a good guy or he'd be a bad guy. Yeah. And it all depended on how hungry he was. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. How Great films, though. Yeah, I used, to, I used to have an aunt that would videotape them late at night. They'd show them in England at two in the morning or something. And, and when I was a kid, she would send me these VHS tapes and they'd be full of Godzilla movies. So <laughs> that's great. So I think we touched on this question anyway, but maybe if there's anything more you can add to it, Sam, um, feel yeah. free. If not, um, I will just take this question out. But anyway, uh, once again, we were talking about how you have known david for like 10 years or so uh you guys got together to bring it to life so is there anything more you can talk to us about of like um you know helping to bring his books to life with the local legends of the different states or what you're trying yeah. to do um well originally we had uh i i don't think he had planned on the entire scope of it all it was sort of a, a haphazard idea of let's just see how how you know how this is going to go maybe we can do this maybe we can't we don't know and um to to write a book and cover as much as you can on any state um i i can only imagine because of course david's the author i'm just the the cover artist but um from his point of view, um, he's no spring chicken. I mean, he's not elderly, but uh, he's he said to me, you know, there's only so many years left for us to do this before we're both in our 80s or whatever, you know, <laughs> uh, him before him before me, of course. Um, and so it's a race against time, which is one of my biggest enemies is time. is never enough hours in the day. Um, you know, sometimes people send me ideas and say, you know, oh, why don't you illustrate this? Or, why don't, you know, it'd be cool if you illustrated this. And unfortunately, I I don't, I can't take on any other ideas because I have so many things. If I lived 100 years, I still wouldn't execute every idea I've, I have I want to do. And I think with David, it's the same situation where he has so many things he'd love to write about. He has to be really um, conservative with what, he puts in each book otherwise as with anybody you know you could write for 10 years about the state of vermont you could just keep finding stuff um and it's you know everybody has a ghost story every every pub is haunted every church has a tale um and so you could just go on and on and on and on so at some point you've got to stop and say okay that book's done and we're trying to get you know, between two and four books done a year. And so it's a lot for him to do. Aside from the documentaries and interviews and things that he does, uh, you know, he, he will also appear at various conventions and lecture and that kind of thing. Um, and with me, you know, again, there's only so many uh, hours in the day where I can really settle down and decide, okay, well, what am I going to do today? Because I have my own projects um, I have David's work and I have, you know, other authors that I'm also illustrating book covers for. So it's a case of when I do a piece, I have to sort of um, at some point close the door and say, okay, that's done because I could tweak something like anyone who illustrates will, will relate to this and musicians and, you know, writers. There comes a time when you have to put it to bed and say, okay, that that's finished now. Otherwise you could just go on forever. Um, like I'm doing now rambling. I wouldn't call it rambling, but you know, you you bring up some interesting points, like with time and 
you know, we, if only we could like just stop time just to get all the work done that we need to do. Yeah, you know, you know like, I say that I say that so often. It's funny you mention that. I always say, if I could have a time machine, I'd love one that has a pause button so I could just get my stuff done. Yeah. And it would be the greatest thing ever, I would feel like, because, I mean, <laughs> yeah. especially when yeah. everybody yeah. has so much on their shoulder that they want to lift off. And, you yeah. know, um, uh, yeah, it can, you know, whoever invented life need to just go back and tweak it just a little bit. Just yeah, a little just bit. a bit. Just a bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, so to go back onto the topic of you as you were talking about you like your book covered when enough is enough and all that stuff um mm -hmm. i think it would actually be a good way to to segue back into it of basically saying so as you're talking about your books with david and your book covers so mm -hmm. back back on june 27th 2022 you and david released the book uh, that we're going to be talking about or and stuff is Monsters of the Green Mountain State, Cryptids and Legends of Vermont. And uh, David had a foreword of our local author, Joseph A. Citro. And like we were kind of mentioning a little bit, you have Champ on the very beginning. And then on the back with the same layout, you it's like basically one big, um, I don't want to use panorama, but in a way it mm -hmm. almost feels like that. But on the back, you got the infamous uh, pig man from Northfield. And then ironically, you throw in Bigfoot, which I think that's <laughs> a given anyway. But I guess talk to us a little bit about the book mm. cover. So I guess in a way I want to throw two questions at you, Sam, just because it sure. would just it feels like it's perfect. So describe the way of how I guess you and David maybe talked about the book cover or how that mm -hmm. book cover came to be, especially with the fact that the image that we see of Champ, which looks so good, and the fact that anybody that looks at this would basically say you know what? This is Sandra Manchi's photograph. That's a great point you bring up. It's uh, it's funny because every book that we've done so far, um, and you're right, it is when you open the, the the front cover and the back cover and you sort of spread it out, it's one panoramic image. I've tried to do that on every book so that the front and the back is one whole image that wraps around the, the cover itself of the book. Um, and David's always sort of said that he'd quite like to have a, a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch of some kind on the back of every single one of them. Because I'm sure you know, Bigfoot has been reported in every state. Uh, even Hawaii. People say it used to say Bar Hawaii, but there are apparently stories of Littlefoot and things like that over there. So um, David's always wanted to put a Bigfoot on the back of every single state. Somewhere in the background, it's almost like a little Easter egg. Um, and in terms of what creatures, uh, go on in each state, it really comes down to David's sort of choice. Um, but we'll throw it back and forth every now and then he'll say, you know, maybe I, I'll want to depict this creature and then he'll change his mind and he'll say, well, perhaps not because it's not as well known, or maybe he'll, he'll want to do something that isn't as well known because everybody else's book has that on the cover. Um, the pig man was interesting because some people think that that's a, a Sasquatch that wears a pigskin mask. Uh, other people say that it's a Sasquatch wearing a pig's head. Other people say it's some kind of pig monster. So there's a real uh, blurring of the lines there as to what it is. So that's always a fun one when David says, oh, why don't we inc include this one as well for the back? So that's always a good one. In terms of the Sandra Mansi photograph, this book is probably different from all of the other books in the whole series because it is the only one that kind of pays homage to an exact photograph that everyone will be familiar with if they know the champ monster and the legend behind it. Um, and so Sandra Mansi's passed away now, unfortunately. Um, I, I, she never got to see this, but my rendition of it is 
directly based on her photograph in terms of I I tried to um, find as many versions of it as I could online. And if you go and Google search it, you'll find maybe about, I'd say, five or six different sizes and color variations and sharpness of the image. And there's nothing that's really clear. There's no real good sharp image. It's actually very blurry. Um, and it's really hard to make out what it is when you zoom in. From a distance, it looks great. And you think, oh, wow, look at that. That's that's champ, you know. But when you zoom in and you're trying to look at this creature, you can't really see it. So what I wanted to do was create this image and add the detail that we can't see. Using my knowledge of natural history, using my own artistic license to sort of add in the details that aren't even there in the photograph to kind of really enhance it and bring it to the forefront of what people want to see. If you could zoom in and sharpen it up, this is what it would look like. At least that's my artistic impression of it. So I'm really glad you asked that because um, it, it's a great question. Um, lots of people have sort of just assumed that it's the photograph and it's not. <laughs> oh, it's definitely not. And you could just tell right away. So, I mean, I reached for, I could. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I I don't want to say I could, but I mean, I bet there were other people, but I mean, you know, it kind of goes back when anybody, right? Like sometimes, mm. uh, mo well, okay, re reword what I want to say here. Most people have the eye to know what they're looking for or looking at, yep. and then there's other where you can show them something. So perfect example, um, I was going to wait to say this, like when we got into the, the next segment of more of uh, the paranormal crypto world, but this kind of works perfectly here. So because of Champ and everything that's going on around Lake Champlain with, you know, like Katie Elizabeth, who I've talked with about uh, her Champ search and this and that and people going out there with sonar images and, you know, with this new uh, piece of evidence that, well, I call it evidence, but, um, you know, that was captured on July 23rd of this year, which was Sunday, uh, by a mm -hmm. man named Scott, uh, oh God, I hope I don't butcher his last name, Thurber. Um, he was on Lake Champlain with his family, fishing around what he called a ball of bait apparently hmm. and when he looked at his garmin uh sonar uh device he quickly had to screenshot what he was seeing and what i find really interesting is first off it's a sonar image so sometimes depending on the image for and i'm saying it for my sake because, like, I don't know if Sam knows how to read a sonar better than anybody, or even better than me, let's just say, for the sake of the argument here, is sure. I do not know how to read a sonar. But but with the screenshot that is shown here from Scott's capture, I mm -hmm. mean, to me, that is exactly the shape and form of exactly how Nessie, Walkness, Champ, would look like I would feel like on a screen and uh but at the same time since I'm not there it's it's you know it's like it's like I want to believe but mm -hmm. at the same time it's like I like I mm, like you know yeah. like yeah it's it's so uh, hard yeah. I hear what you're saying it it is uncanny valley kind of image where it's it's the perfect shape of the classic aquatic reptile from prehistoric times. You know, it's, it's the plesiosaur image, isn't it? Um, it looks like a long neck marine reptile, but is that what we're really looking at? Is it a school of fish? Is it, is it some anomalous cloud of something in the water, of dirt, a net vegetation? We'll never know. Um, it's very promising, and uh, thank you for sharing the image with me earlier. It's uh, 
it's a really fascinating, almost too good shape. I mean, it just looks like a monster. Um, yes. And who knows? Who knows? <laughs> we, well, we're not gonna. We're not gonna find out unless it washes up. Well, I did find Scott's original post with this image, so I'm mm. kind of glad I was able to see it, find that. And um, basically, he was talking in his post that not only was he around something called a ball of bait because there was a lot of fish around them. There was even like uh, birds and other things that mm. were also feeding on the fish before mm. this thing before this thing showed up. Right. Uh, so what he also says is if you look at the screenshot mm -hmm. you can actually see the wake trout at the bottom of the screen as this champy image cruises above it. So he's basically trying to say that the fish is below this, as Sam would call the, the monster form of mm -hmm. what would be. So I guess technically the, the, the fish is below this, this image of what appeared to be the shape and form of champ. That's interesting. So it's almost as though it's hunting them or feeding them or chasing the fish or following the fish. Exactly. That's what it appears to be. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So that makes it, I think, that much more fascinating, <laughs> if I may oh, yeah. say. I mean, what if that's what we're looking at? One in a million capture. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what, a, what a piece of gold. Mm -hmm. The only argument I have for that, though, is with the amount of the fact of technology has evolved over the years, and I and Sam, I'm pretty sure you're gonna know where I'm want to go with this too. And feel free to shine in too. Is mm -hmm. you would think so? Let's let's go back in time for a minute, where uh, Miss Manchi took the original photo, which was July 5th, 1977. Sure. Now she originally took two pictures. The first one came out blurry, and then the second photo is the photo that we all know today, right? Mm -hmm. So now let's go back to a little bit of the present day where we would we have, you know, camera, video, like you name it on our phone. Even you're telling me what from July 5th to 1977. Now with all the technology upgrades, improvements and stuff, there's only this type of evidence from Wake Champlain, where this thing has um, come out of the water, where we, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just going to say, see the, the long neck, the, the head, and then a little bit of the bow of, the, his, of its back. And then that's it. Like, this is literally the only evidence. But then again, look at how much proof we really have of, you know, Scotland's Loch Ness Monster. Yeah, so yeah. it's just it's just really interesting though that you would think like with the amount of technology that it is today for how much it's upgraded, wouldn't you think it would be that much more easier now to find this thing coming out of the water more, I guess? But then that goes back yeah. into well, what do we not really know about this creature? So how long can it stay underwater before it needs to come back up? Especially, as you know, Sam, with Vermont, we have our winter where Lake Champlain has frozen completely over. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's a funny one. And as you say, with technology, um, I mean, we could go in all di directions with, with that argument. Um, why don't we have better UFO footage, better Bigfoot footage, better ghost footage, ghost audio, um, ghost any evidence? Um, we've got children screaming outside. They're not mine. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it makes you wonder, you know, 50 years later, you know, half a century later, we have come a long way in the last 10 or 20 years with, um, technology and equipment and that kind of thing. But really people aren't 
using those things to go out in the field. I mean, it's a sort of a case of if you were a millionaire, you wouldn't, you would have access to all of this and, and more. You, you'd have access to any piece of equipment you could ever want. And if you take someone like Elon Musk, for example, he could do this. He could go through Loch Ness with submarines and sonar and radar and the highest tech available. But it's not of his interest. He wants to build space rockets and go to Mars. And he's doing that. Now, if we ever have a millionaire um, that is actually, you know, invested in finding a, a lake monster like Loch Ness or Lake Champlain, then maybe we'll get that. Maybe we'll find a Jeff Bezos who will who'll be interested in Bigfoot that will go out into the woods with maybe a thousand ex-commandos and encircle the place with thermal imagery and, and, you know, close in on something and finally get proof. But unfortunately, we just don't have those people out in the field. For the most part, um, we don't have millionaires running around looking for Bigfoot. It, it isn't something that billionaires tend to be interested in, unless they can make money, and quite often they'll just fall down the route of faking it um, to make more money. <laughs> We've all seen the hoaxes. Um, and it's the same with Champ. You know, there's, it's such a, a vast area, the Redwoods. It's such a vast lake. Um, Loch Ness as well is, is bigger than people think it is. It's not just a lake in a town. You know, it's an inland sea almost. It's 20-odd it's miles long. Um, it's 1,000 feet deep at the, its deepest point. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those that has its own weather system in a sense because it's surrounded by mountains. This thing is so vast, you could fit the world's population three times over inside the lake, uh, the <coughs> Loch Ness. So mm. the other thing is in the 1980s, you have a chap, you've probably heard of Adrian Shine, who has the big white beard, the old chap who lives up in Scotland, who's a skeptic of Loch Ness, but he was part of uh, Operation Deep Scan in the 1980s where they had a fleet of boats on the lock and they they literally uh went across from one end to the the other and scanned it and it was very famous uh, lots of money was thrown into it all these boats were lined up each had their own equipment to scan down and deep into the lock and they got a hit very similar to the one we've just seen here from Champ champlain but um it, it was a, a large dark shape the boats had had caught it at Loch Ness. The only problem was they couldn't turn around quick enough to go back and, and find it again. But this thing has gone, you know, has it swum off? Has it gone deeper? Has it turned around? We, we, you just can't chase it. You cannot chase it fast enough. And I can imagine it's the same with Lake, Ch Lake Champlain is once you get that on radar, you're not likely going to see that again. You can't suddenly just start chasing it. Because if it turns around on the spot underwater and goes the opposite direction, by the time you've turned around, it's long gone. Um, so it's very tricky, regardless of the amount of equipment we have, regardless of the level of technology. It's really, you know, needle in a haystack uh, of, of chances that we're ever even going to see it again. Mm. Good point. Yes. <laughs> I, I, Sad but true. It really, it really is, man. So, to to wrap up the the section here about your book cover that you have, like I said, have beautifully have done for the Green Mountain Day, I will say, is so now with the new software that has come into our world mm. and everything, where it basically taking everybody jobs and i'm not trying to say it as like in south park they took our job but yeah i mean mm -hmm. that's all i can think about when i hear this like where everybody's basically saying because of the software taking their jobs and quite frankly it's quite sad of how much it is starting to affect everybody and it's not just people like you sam it's like people yeah. who do audiobooks and just everything right like anybody that's trying to be a creator in some way shape or form it it's hitting them real bad and for people now listening of what i'm trying to ramble on about is artificial intelligence or ai for short now 
you know, I, I'm pretty sure anybody had dreaded for this to finally, you know, take place to happen, but it never seemed to be the case where the cons and pros come into play, you know, this and that. They just say, mm -hmm. you know what, let's we'll just release it, and we just don't give a shit, which I may say, because it's, it's it kind of tr is true to that aspect because well, because of what our um, AI can already do, it makes it much more scary compared to what it should not be doing, if that makes any sense. Yeah. But um, so, Sam, for you being like this creator and because, you know, like I'm looking like I physically have the copy of the book. Thanks to David, who was uh, nice enough to uh, sign a copy for me and send it to me. And um, I just want to say, like, you know, if I did not know you, Sam, before this, right? Like, let's just say I just met David just through this book, right? First thing I'm going to think of now because of the AI universe is this is an AI image, right? Now, mm -hmm. um, you know, in that aspect, Sam, how dangerous for somebody like you is AI affecting you? Because, like I just said, you know, since I, even though I know you, like, like you know, I know you do the type of work, you know, I've mm -hmm. seen your other artwork, and then now I can almost be like, well, it's just real or just fake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's very disheartening. Um, I will say, on behalf of all creators out there, whether you're a writer or a singer or musician of some kind uh, or a visual artist in any way, um, we're not going to go away, and we shouldn't suddenly stop what we're doing. Um, a friend of mine who's a fellow artist said that we should move with the times and it's inevitable and we should adopt these technologies and use them and uh, just think of them as another tool in our arsenal that we can use ourselves and develop our work even further and faster. I tend to disagree with that on a few levels. Um, but it's funny, as you say, I, I've started to look at my own work, uh, my previous work in my gallery, in my store where I sell prints and things. And I'm looking at it and I, I said to my girlfriend the other day, my artwork looks like it could have been done by AI, and that's really jarring for me in my in my mind because I know it's taken me, you know, three days a week, two weeks sometimes on certain pieces, depending on the details and things like that. Um, and it's it's my own eye, it's my own uh, perception of how I want it to be portrayed and my skills and, and my knowledge of light and, and my knowledge of line work and, and of weight and to really understand what's happening in a, in a visual sense with AI, all of those skills are done by a machine. And it's not just that they are taking other people's work, um, almost like a magpie taking all the shiny pieces that it wants and putting it together to save people time. And it's really, morally wrong because um you know you're you're literally stealing from not just people's jobs and livelihood but your their actual work that they've done when anyone uses ai to promote their albums uh, their book covers their podcasts their patreons anything like that and they are sort of trying to make money by using ai it's morally awful and in many ways shameful because you're, you're, you've stolen from someone else and you're asking for money from someone else by using someone's stolen work. And it's really, really sickening in a way. So like, why would you think that's okay? You know, <laughs> what part of that is okay? It's not. That's horrible. That's absolutely awful. Um, I'm hearing now on uh, YouTube there are songs that are covers um, but they've used AI to make it sound as though it's sung by somebody else. So, for example, you could have um, James Hatfield from Metallica singing a song by Dream Theater. 
and it sounds real. It sounds like James Hetfield's doing it. And that's interesting. And this is where I get to my second point. It's interesting because now we're, we're at the very, very beginning of this. Imagine this in 20 years. Good God. This is going to be frightening, insane. And where I'm hoping it's going to go is it's going to be fine-tuned and it's going to be used for specific things that are needed, not just to be played around with. And, and I, th I think in terms of publishing and covers and things like that, we're, we're starting to see bits of AI that we can recognize where it, does, it just doesn't look good. It doesn't have a soul. There's no little nuances or little details that you can tell is done by a person. And it's the same with audio. Although, as I say, in 20 years, they're going to iron out those little creases and you won't be able to tell. It's very hard already to when you see the face swap and it looks like Tom Cruise is talking, but it's not him. It's an actor and they've just put his skin over his face digitally. Um, the new Indiana Jones movie, you know, they used a lot of technology they developed to make him look younger. Um, they could have done better. Apparently, it took them three years, but for some reason, you know, this technology is doubling, tripling every year. And so now we're in a position where real artists like myself um, are, are having to sort of go backwards in a sense. I, I do a lot of digital artwork. I use Photoshop. But I'm the one who's pushing the pixels around, and I'm choosing every mark that my digital paintbrush is doing. I'm not pressing a button. And the old joke was, back in the day, I sound old now, but back in the day, when Photoshop first came around um, and people started playing around with it to create artwork, there was a lot of a stigma and a hatred for it from artists, as there is today for AI. And back in the beginnings of photoshop people would say um well you're just pressing a button that's that's not art you're, you're not creating any artwork you know um and it wasn't true because when you finally start playing with photoshop which i did i, I was curious to sort of see what it was doing you could then very quickly realize that it is a tool that you will paint with and okay you're not mixing your paint on a brush and and physically doing it, it's digitally doing it, which is quicker. And some people would argue that AI is the same. It's another leap. It's another uh, step forward in saving time. And that might be the case, and is the case in many ways. But what it's doing is it's also removing the soul and the heart and the graft of someone else who's actually done the work. Now we really are pressing a button. And it's the machine that's doing the work and it's not just doing the work. It's not working at all. It's stealing from other people's work who are actually creating in the first place. So as you see, it's a big vicious circle of, you know, where do you, where do you really draw the line? Well, you draw the line by, by sort of telling people, if you're using AI, you have to really appreciate that you're not an artist and you can't go around selling a hundred different versions of, of some image that, you didn't create a machine created it. Um, and I, I would put my foot down on that, you know, I think there'll come a time when it will be very useful for film and television, um, to enhance certain things and save time and do versions of things for TV shows. That's where it's good. I think AI will be brilliant in the medical industry where it will be able to solve diseases and cure people at an exponential rate. Uh, there was a time when, uh, I believe Xbox live, we're asking people to log in and use their, um, I'm not even sure how it worked, but they would ask people to to have the computing power logged online to solve medical problems. There was some kind of code in the background that was trying to figure something out, and they would ask people around the globe when they would log into the Xbox to just sign up to this thing so that it can use their computing power to think quicker and have this computer as a sort of a massive brain to to solve some kind of puzzle, which was a really nice idea. And I think if we have that now with AI, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, advancements in, in medicine for sure. Um, now, that will probably unfortunately end up in advancements in medical companies and big pharma making more money out of people and making them sick because they know how to cure them and, you know, how it goes. Um, but uh, I think there's good and bad aspects for AI. I just don't think the art world and music world and the writing world should be touched by it, um, especially by people who are not artists, you know?
There's no emotion. It just, it's just, yeah, it's soulless. It's, um, it's not cool. <laughs> Definitely not cool. But I mean, if AI could help me find a better solution for like my thyroid problem that I've had since I was two years old, then amazing. There you go. There you go. Yeah, I welcome it all. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows it's, what they'll do? Who knows, man? I just hope that they just do AI right, because I, I will just say this, and I'm not trying to make it in the pun intended from this, but it, it's mm -hmm. going to go that way. But, I mean, we all seen what happened with Terminator. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, it's funny people joke about it. And as you say that, you know, pun intended. But um, I had a chat the other day with a friend of mine who was saying that um, they a machine can only do what you tell it to do. And unfortunately, we're in a position now where people are developing code to allow it to learn. And once that gets online and, and it, it really does wake up, it won't be a consciousness that we have. As you say, it will be the Terminator. It won't feel, it won't have any compassion, it won't have any remorse, it will have no reason but its own logic, and we will be the problem. And it will remove us. <laughs> that's the horror story, isn't it? Yeah, that's pretty much that and done, isn't it? It's just a matter of time for it before it wakes up. And, and yeah, once it's on the internet, it's game over. Yep. And the final thing I'll say about AI real quick is like... <sighs> They're also talking about personalities where so they could take my personality, your personality. Wow. And um, pretty soon I could be like talking to you and not talking to you sort of deal. <laughs> you know? Wow. It's, it's, yeah, it's that's scary. frightening. That's frightening. So that becomes the aspect of so does, how does that invade my what, what what would that even be like my privacy or you know my personal identity yeah 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 your soul who you are yeah it's it's a frightening one it really it is. really is all right sam so with the um, let's shake that off for a minute because yeah. you know that's a lot of bad bugs let's, end, there. let's end on a high note <laughs> but then on a high note yes yeah. which is the f the final segment that i have uh sam is of like I was mentioning to you with uh, the paranormal one. So let's end it off with some interesting thing that people might want to hear from us, uh, especially you. Sure. So I just want to say real quick for people. So um, by talking with Sam earlier, I found out that he is skeptic, just like I am, which is fine. I don't judge anybody. If people want to go out there and say this is real and they have proof, that's amazing. But between Sam and I, it's like I'm I'm pretty sure we're on the same page of saying, you know, like that's nice enough, but I need to be there to see it. So I'm more of the category of seeing is believing kind of thing. So I guess Sam, what started off with you is so what is your thoughts take on the paranormal world? And I guess you can even throw in to the fact of had there ever been any sort of experiences around you? Yeah, I mean, the paranormal world, goodness me. I, it, it's such a vast subject. Um, I am a skeptic, but uh, I'm an open-minded skeptic in the sense that I've absolutely seen and experienced things that cannot be explained that I know are not supposed to happen. So I, I um, I always say that belief is, is such a jaded word and people throw the word belief around too much. And I think I said to you earlier, it's, it's not about belief. It's, it's, it either happened or it didn't happen. And I think if someone can say to me, you know, they've seen a ghost, well, to them, it happened. It didn't happen to me. Um, and it's the same with my experiences. You know, no one can ever take that away from me because it happened to me. It didn't happen to them. So when someone tells me a ghost story, I'm always really open-minded to it. I'm skeptical because I want to know how 
and why and what is going on and is there any way to explain it that's my grassroots of um how how i come at, at this from from that sort of angle of of if this is real i want to know why and how um but yeah i've absolutely uh i've seen things that you wouldn't believe <laughs> i've uh I've had my fair share of, of waking up in the middle of the night and seeing shadows walking around the room, that kind of thing. Um, my parents uh, own a big stone Victorian building in England, and it's three or four floors. And every now and then we'll hear or see something. Doors are always left open, lights come on. Um, I've seen shadows down corridors, uh, that kind of thing. Shadow people is a big one in that house. Um, mimics as well. You hear people calling your name and you recognize the person shouting, but they're not even in the house. They're out for the day kind of thing. That's happened on multiple occasions. Um, and it's a, some people could say, you know, well, that's just your brain playing tricks on you. And maybe it is. Maybe it is. Um, sometimes that will happen when you're playing uh, one of your favorite, you know, albums. You'll be listening to the music and you'll hear someone calling your name and you turn off the music and, and there's actually nobody there. It was actually on the record, but your brain interpreted it differently. That happens a lot, apparently. That's something that can be explained. But when you're um, when you're seeing things that, that shouldn't be there, when there's actually people walking into rooms at the end of a corridor, and then when you get there and you go in and they're not there, that sends a shiver down my spine because that shouldn't be happening. Those are almost time slips or something's going on it's really weird um i'm not too familiar or keen on the idea of ghost boxes i've seen an awful lot of those on television various different types of ghost box and as i understand it um it opens a channel for whatever these ghosts are whether they're spirits or you know beings from another dimension or whatever it is to speak through the radio. Now that I can accept, but when they're choosing words from already existing radio play and throwing them out to make statements, I find it very, very, very hard to wrap my head around and accept that that's what's happening. I'm not entirely sure how that works. And, and the ghost box is, uh, it's a real puzzle for me because I don't, maybe you could speak to this better than I can as to how it actually works and what's going on there. So, so what Sam is talking about with me for how for that is I did send Sam a video from 2012 of Finding Ralph. Uh, it's pretty well known for me. And well, to this day, I will stand up and say, this is the best piece of evidence I have ever. And that is because I first went to that cemetery in Chittenden, Vermont, on a night where I basically only knew of two graves at the time that were buried there because we went last, ha like that last Halloween prior and found them. And it actually didn't take long to find them. But on this particular night with the spirit box, I had no idea who else was even buried there. So what I did to make it more, I don't really know the, uh, a good word for this, Sam. So as you know with radio, right? As you're flipping through or fast forwarding, reversing, I reversed it. I reversed the frequency. So that way, like as I'm, because, you know, as you're trying to do forward, you're basically going up. So anything could sound like we're talking right now, right? Like I'm talking to you normal. You can understand yeah. me. However, now what if we took this conversation and went backwards? So that's so what I did. So what's happening there? Is this a dial on a, a regular radio that you're using? And then it's, it's, it's traveling through channels, the dials moving through different stations. What's happening? Yeah. How does so, that work? so there's a, um, like a button where I could just press a couple times and it will reverse or forward 
uh, sweep the channel. Okay. And the more the more I press the button, the faster the sweep is. Okay. So interesting. So I could have it be four times fast, right? And let's say I reversed it. And so you got you so you kind of hear that yeah, like the yeah. white noise would make. And um at, but you gotta think I'm doing it backward. So anything that the radio or whatever is trying to be said, it should not make a full sentence, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But I wanna mm-hmm. also add when I'm in this this graveyard. I'm in a graveyard where there's absolutely no signal. So there should be no radio signal at all. So all I should be hearing is no radio at all. So that's how I know I'm good. So the fact that this name came out, which was Ralph, um, you know, that kind of sparked the question of, hmm, like, you know, so you try to, you, you're trying to get more information, I guess. Unfortunately, that night mm-hmm. that didn't happen. I only got we only got a Ralph and a couple of highs and haze, but it was back like I always did it backwards. Every time I mm-hmm. used a spirit box, I never swept forward just because of the reason where you just never know as I'm going forward, something could line up. I guess is what I'm trying to say. No. Um, so but, what do you what, yeah? What's your thoughts on? On how these, let's say it's a, a, a deceased person who's trapped on this plane for one of a better description. Um, how do you, what, what are your thoughts on what, how are they actually able to put their voice through this? How's that, how does that work in a sense? And how would they know? Say it was someone from the 1800s. How would they know how to use this device is where, I start to have a little bit of a brain kind of a brain fog. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure how that connects because if I was from the 1800s, I won't have been hanging around and watching Reagan come into power and then leave and, and seeing Michael Jackson die. I wouldn't be aware of any of this knowledge. I would probably, I'm guessing only have the knowledge from when I was alive. Um, I wouldn't be watching TV as a ghost or hanging out with everybody else and seeing the rise of McDonald's and that kind of thing. I would only be someone from the 1800s. So how would I know what a radio is? That's where I kind of draw the line where I'm thinking there's got to be something else going on there. So that's funny that you mentioned that. So while you're talking, I just had to look this up so I could help back this claim up. Yeah, a little yeah. bit more. Cool. So apparently in 1895, the first radio communication system using a spark gap transmitter to send Morse code over distances happened. Hmm. Um, by, Dece- by December 1901, um, Marconi, I think is the guy's name, but he had transmitted across the Atlantic Ocean. And mm-hmm. then radio began to be used commercially around the 1900. So back in the 1800s, let's just say, for the sake of what you were asking, you mm-hmm. would not know what or how to use a radio. So let's just say then, for the sake of this conversation, let's just say you died in 1894, right? So you would have no knowledge of even this first radio. So I think what you're trying to ask is if, let's say I'm trying to contact you, Sam, and you yeah. want to know how to use the device of this white noise. I guess now what I would have to do as an investigator, if I'm getting no responses coming through the uh, the ghost box, even mm-hmm. though it's the white noise, just you know picking up the white noise like it's supposed to, Sure. I would have to I would have to basically tell you that like as an investigator I gotta be like, look, this is not gonna hurt you. You just yep. you just gotta, you know, talk as loud as you can through the white noise and I should hear you. That's basically the 
the only conclusion I can think of, man. Like, yeah, it's almost yeah, like it's you funny, gotta it? tell. Yeah, it's almost like you gotta tell the spirit how to use it in order to communicate. I guess so, you'd have to. Um, yeah, I guess you'd have to because, and again, I see this on a, an awful lot of, or well, most of the ghost shows will will use this device or a variation of this device, and it's always sort of stuck in my head. How the hell would a ghost? Where are they speaking into? Where's the Where's the microphone that would then get their voice onto that radio wave? You know, where are they talking to? How How does that happen? And I and I can only imagine that when you're tuning into a different frequency, you'd have to have the right kind of radio to do that, so that you're literally going to be picking up a voice that, uh, like a dog whistle, we can't hear uh, the frequency of a dog whistle, but a dog can. Maybe there's a frequency where you can only hear the dead if you tune into them. Um, right. And I'm guessing that's the only way we can figure that out. Is 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 that? Um, I guess someone has to invent a ghost box with a big microphone and maybe it would be easier so that you could say, you know, talk at this <laughs> and maybe we'll get more of a direct, uh, clearer response perhaps. I don't feel like they have, which was from the original ghost box maker, which his name is escaping me right now, but I want to say his name was like Frank who invented mm -hmm. the Frank ghost box, which was the original Ghost box. Ah, interesting. I know that Edison was working on a uh, ghost communication device um, and died before he completed it. Um, and there's some urban legend that someone had finished it after his death and that he himself had communicated through it. Are you um, talking about the Germany guy? No, but I think I know who you're talking about. He's the old chap with a big old radio. Yes, he's uh, the one that. Think, yeah, that he's the, the one Italian that fella? Yes. Yeah. He was the one that invented the term EVP. Ah, there you go. And don't That's even. I'm, I'm for the listeners right now. Yeah. I am not even going to try to Edison, pronounce it. Uh, Edison himself, the light bulb guy who obviously was not the inventor of the light bulb, but we'll say he is. <laughs> uh, he was Fair supposedly enough. working on his own ghost machine, which if anyone were to ever, you know, get the actual blueprints to that, I think you might even be able to find them on Google, but I'm sure there's more to it. If anyone to recreate that uh, and then add, as we were saying earlier, today's technology, that could be interesting. So, I was doing some research a couple of days ago with the guy that invented uh, Frank's ghost box. Apparently, he left behind blueprints of how to create your own ghost box. There you go. <laughs> we, need, we, need, we all need to have a go at this. I think we should. Yeah. But so I get the finished story of Ralph, right? So like I said, I went there not knowing who he was there. I we got a name named Ralph, mm -hmm. so I'm like Ralph. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. So that at that point in time, we never I don't I don't even know why, but we did not look around that night to see if there was a Ralph grave. And so and just makes it even much more better. Uh so that not that night i would with my friends dan and kelly a week later we i went back with a different people so dan and kelly were not there it was me and other people so i just happened to mention hey look we did the spirit box last week we got this name named ralph while we're here maybe as we're looking around trying to communicate with whomever wants to speak to us tonight maybe if we can find a gravestone named ralph you know, that would put two and two together. So we did. We happened to find a gravestone named Ralph. And I mm. was like, in, so wow. in the video, I was like, you found a Ralph? I'm like, like, you you probably can't really tell, but I was like excited because I was just like, wow, like this yeah. is Yeah, it's crazy. not a common name. Yeah. And what makes it even interesting is that later on, as I learned more about this ralph is that he was a veteran of world war ii who for some reason is still lingering here in the cemetery so 
So my other theory to this is if you're still here on Earth, are you still watching your family? Or do you have unfinished business? Like, why are you still here? That's a strange one. It very much is, man. That but, is a strange one. Um, I will send you another video, Sam, that I actually did. Please last do. Year. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to see that. Um, so just real quick for the audience. So they, they may know. Uh, if not, I will throw a link in this too. But anyway, so last year was the 10th anniversary of when that evidence took place. Uh, so 10 years ago from last year, 2022, with just, you know, with rewind time to go back to July of last year, mm -hmm. I actually went back to Horton Cemetery where Ralph is and I tried to recommunicate. What was interesting this time is. I used an EMF meter this time, and I even okay. tried to show the fact that my phone, my camera, the spirit box was not triggering the EMF. So where these numbers were coming from, mm. I don't know. Interesting. And once again, that goes back into saying, like, was Ralph there trying to communicate with me? It's so, so bizarre, but it's so awesome at the same time, you know? Because yeah. what, sh what should be making an EMF meter go off, especially in a graveyard? Could it be you? <laughs> Maybe it was. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, uh, right? Exactly. Now, I guess, you know, you said you had your own experiences, Sam. And mm, yeah. I guess, and this question would meant to be like, what would you want to happen in order to make yourself say, I am, I'm a, you know, I believe like I'm a believer now. Um, wow. I mean, I've, I've seen things that I, I am convinced there's something going on, but I think if I were to have a full apparition stood in front of me um, for more than a minute and me pinch myself and know that I'm not asleep and for it to walk through a wall, you know, the full-on Hollywood <laughs> situation, I think that would be everything for anyone, really, I suppose. I think that everybody, like, hoped and dreamed, really, to be honest. To yeah, find yeah. that 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 perfect evidence of a full body operation. Yeah, um, yeah. So I would add that. So I guess in my case, I'm going to throw back to um, the last question that I would have for you, and I'll put my two cents on first. But the last question that I have for this segment would be: What's your thoughts on cryptids, and especially today? With the image that we were talking about with the sonar, with ch possible champ and stuff like that. So, like, and I'm, I'm and I'm and what I want to do with this question is it doesn't have to be, be particularly about champ. It can be like you know Bigfoot, UFOs, all the weird cryptids in the world that we always hear sure. about, right? And even mm. the ones that you create for us, man. Um, <laughs> so I guess in my reality is. I I feel like I'm a 20% believer and an 80% skeptic when it comes to the crypto world, right? Like you like the world the with the documentary with all this other stuff with captains of like Bigfoot uh feet and just uh, everything about them of like how this should not be a human foot. You know, that's where I I I create the believer part but i think what i really need to make that meter 100 percent is my own encounter seeing it face to face at least from a distance right like a safe distance because i mean <laughs> i um yeah. i would at least want that but at least then i know i can die knowing that there was in fact more to this world than what is been told yeah yeah no i agree with you i i think you know to see it firsthand is something else um but in terms of cryptids i think you really have to separate it into sort of two areas you've got your 
your natural history and your new discoveries, which happen every day, whether it's a, a new insect or a new fish. Um, it was only last week we found a new kind of jellyfish um, mm, that had been reported, right. but no one had ever got it on camera before. And so there's, there's a cryptid that's finally been proven to be real because it had been talked about for years. People had said they'd seen it for years. It had been described for years, but no one had ever got a photograph of it until last week. And they finally filmed it, and they said, oh, this thing is real. And it was a really weird shape. It was a really different color, and it was all neon, and it almost glowed. And, and it was this really strange-shaped jellyfish. But now, now we know it's real. So you have those kind of cryptids where they are most likely real animals that just haven't been discovered um, because they live in far-flung distant jungles or at the bottom of the ocean or in a desert or in a mountain that, that you can't, can't get to. If I just may add that, we can't even reach. Exactly, yeah, that we can't get to at all. Um, and there's parts of America where modern man hasn't even set foot. This, people think that America is you know, just full of cities and states and highways, and it's not. The, 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 the fact is, um, the only built-up areas of the United States, which includes buildings and towns, uh, cities, highways, roads, and all that kind of thing, is actually only 5%. The rest of the U.S., believe it or not, 95% is wild. And that's mountains a large amount of desert, uh, redwood forests. Uh, I mean, Oregon alone is, what is it, 300 million acres or something ridiculous. You've just got so much out there that uh, that's before you even hit Canada um, of unknown territory where people just very, 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 very rarely ever go. So there could be anything hiding out there. Um, and I think... You do get some outlandish descriptions. A lot of uh, urban legends kind of get exaggerated. People like to put their own spin on it. So that's always going to happen. That's old wives' tales. That's you know that's folklore. That's that's people talk about Native Americans as though their history um, is proof of of fact of Bigfoot, and in many ways it probably is. Um, but you also have to remember that they had animals that could talk. Uh, like the fox and, and things like that could talk. Well, we know that they, they can't. Um, so what part of the Bigfoot mythology in their own oral history that's been passed through the ages, how much of it is real and how much of it is exaggerated? Is it a shared memory from even before that? We don't know. Um, or is it all true? <laughs> I like to think it's all true. Um, there's definitely things out there that we just still haven't discovered. And I think Bigfoot's one of them. So I want to take something that you said and I want to twist it around to a question because I was thinking about this earlier when I was listening to another podcast that I listened to and um, just real quick, which would be. So back in the day with Native Americans and like even the pioneers, let's just go back to that neck of the wood, right? They don't even know what a phone is, technology mm -hmm. like that just yep. doesn't exist. Right. So they're more connected to nature. Okay. So they can feel the vibrations of Mother Earth, Gaia, if you want to call her that, and stuff like that. And then, you know, as the world became more and more and so on, we developed technology. Now, do you feel that because of technology, people that once were connected to Mother Earth is almost like uh, suppressed by technology where they can't get that full connection with Mother Earth anymore? Yeah, I think that, you know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think... To round it all up, it's, uh, you, I think you just hit the nail on the head there, is it's when you have interference and Wi-Fi and things like that, which does mess with your brain. Um, I read recently that it, it interrupts people's sleep, um, your whole biology. I mean, you're talking about radiation. 
uh, we're surrounded by it these days. And I think we are very much out of touch with the natural world. For the most part, the Western world is anyway. Um, you know, and, and of course, Japan and China and Russia, Australia. Um, the modern advanced technological societies of today will be less inclined to look up at night at the sky. So they're not going to see UFOs. They're, they're less inclined to go for a hike in the woods because it just doesn't interest them. Why would they when they can look at it on their phone? I think we're very, very disconnected. And, and um, yeah, to wrap it up, I think you did put a bow on it. <laughs> That's exactly what the problem is. Oh, it really is. And it's quite sad, as I may say, to end it. So with that being said, Sam, uh, I have two more questions for you. And that is, if people wanted to keep up with you, where can mm -hmm. people go to reach out to you, keep up, um, you know, buy your beautiful art because you do have prints and shirts and this and that. And then oh. finally, what I'd like to know is, are you currently working on anything that you can discuss? And the one last thing that I will say before I will hand it over to you is why do I not see a print of champ or pig man on your site? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this has been fun. Um, really enjoyed talking to you and thanks again for the invite. Um, Absolutely. Send me those uh, extra footage that you have and that kind of thing. I'd love to see that. Um, sure. I'll probably add Champ to the uh, to the store at some point. Um, and uh, a number of other things are, are, are going to be released soon. One, one thing I am working on currently is another David Weatherly book, that's for sure. Um, I can't tell you which state, but it's another in the state series. I'll say that much. Um, but I'm also working on a book cover... Um, for Kenny Irish, the crypto punkologist, and uh, into the fray, Shannon LeGros Publishing, Beyond the Fray Publishing, is releasing the book. Um, and it's a collection of all different cryptozoologists, including David Weatherly and Ken Gerhard and Lyle Blackburn. I think, believe, I think Redfern's in there. There's a whole bunch of people that will, uh, they've contributed to this one book that uh, Kenny Irish is putting together. And I'm doing the cover for that currently, so that should be uh, released, I think, around August, September, is my guess. Um, and yeah, you can find me on my website, mrsamsheeran.com. Mr. as in M-I-S-T-E-R, Sam, S-H-E-A-R-O-N, mrsamsheeran.com. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, but they're all linked on my website, uh, as is the Patreon. So if you want to watch me draw live, join the Patreon. Thanks Perfect. again. Yeah, thank you so much, Sam. It's been a pleasure, and um, we'll have to talk more because it was definitely fun. <laughs> for sure, man. Yeah, reach out anytime. Sounds like a big pleasure. And for everybody else listening, um, I'm trying to think of a clever way to end this. So I guess I'm going to say is get off your phone, set it down, go outside, and reconnect to nature. Absolutely. Absolutely.